All right, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Hey, this is the day that the Lord have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning to you, and thank you so much uh, for tuning in to In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman. Hey, today is a beautiful day. It's an exciting day. It's a lovely day. But most of all, it's the day that you're alive and I'm alive, and it's enough to give God praise for. So shout out to everybody who's watching today. Shout out to our Instagram audience this morning. Shout out to our Facebook Live audience. My wife, Pastor Sophia, is on this morning. Miss Michelle McClung is rocking in the house this morning. Girl, I got to give you my high five today. Love you. Good to see you. Miss Victoria Williams is in the house. Kelly Johnson is in the house. Thank you so much for being on this morning. Thank you so much for tuning in. Clinton Powell is in the house. Good to see you, my brother. Thank you so much for tuning in. Y'all do me a favor. Make sure you share, you like, you tag, you invite. Start a watch party today. Get other people to come on and be a part of In the Backyard with Pastor Perryman. Miss Sheila T. Roby is in the house. Good to see you. Hey, shout out uh, to Miss Teresa Jones. Girl, you know you got more skills than Kellogg's got cornflakes. Shout out to you. Thank you so much for being on today. Y'all got to do me a favor. You got to share. You got to like. You got to tag. You got to invite. All right. Share, share, share. All right. Hey, shout out to Miss Fabulous 40 and Fabulous. Shout out to you, Miss Patricia Cole, Coleman, girl. You know you be the bomb. You are the raisin and raisin brand, girl. Good to see you. Thank you so much for being on. Hey, my auntie Dorothy Perryman is rocking with us today. Good to see you. Y'all know my auntie is the greatest of all time. When it comes down to teachers, y'all show my auntie some love this morning. But listen, get your coffee, your water, your juice, your tea, whatever you're drinking this morning. Get it today. We're going to have a great time in the Lord. Yes, we are. Uh, man, we're going to have a great time in the Lord. We really are today. Uh, so, man, we're not outside this morning. Ain't nothing wrong outside. I just decided not to go out there today. So, uh, shout out to you guys today. But listen, get your coffee, your water, your juice, your tea. Whatever you're drinking, get it this morning so that we can have uh, a big time uh, in the Lord, all right? So I need you to get your coffee, water, your juice, your tea, whatever you're drinking, get it. Let's have a great time in the Lord this morning. But make sure you share, like, tag, invite, and start a watch party, all right? Miss Diane King is in the house. Good to see you. Yeah, this coffee, this coffee put hair in your chest this morning. That's a super safe coffee right there my wife made. Shout out to Miss Teresa Wells. Good to see you too. But let's get to it today. A hmm. number of years ago, I uh, had an opportunity to see um, a documentary of a family. And uh, in the documentary of the family, you, you could see where the husband and wife was having some challenges and the husband stepped out on the wife and started sleeping around with some woman in the town and ended up getting the woman pregnant. And so now all of a sudden, the child is, is conceived. Nine months later, the child is born. Wife finds out about it, and quite naturally, she's upset. She's frustrated. She's mad at the husband. She's ready to leave him. And they're going through it all, and the husband's doing all he can to apologize. And he's saying that he made the mistake, that he should not have done this. Everything is on him. I should not have done this. I meant no disrespect to you. I know I hurt you. He's going through the whole spill. And they sat down one day before a preacher and they decided that they would work their relationship out. Now, it was a long journey in working their relationship out because the trust has been destroyed. And so the trust had to be rebuilt. So they're working on the relationship to the point now that they are back in love with each other again, to the point that they're hugging on each other. They're, they're having fun with each other. And the, and the wife had forgiven now they had older children and the older children couldn't handle the fact that they got another sibling and this child is born out of wedlock. The children are holding grudges against their father for what he did and they couldn't let it go. And in the documentary, the person who was really talking to them in the documentary said, if she could get over it, meaning their mother, if she could get over it, why can't you? And they were saying, well, that's her. That's not me. He, he didn't just hurt mama. He hurt me. He hurt us. And, 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 and I'll never forgive him for this. And the guy asked the question again. If she could get over it, why can't you? And they keep going on and on and on. And they keep talking about, well, this, this, and this, and this, and this happened, and that happened. I can't believe he did this. And so the question was asked again. If she can get over it, why can't you? I want that to sink into your head today. 
If somebody else can get over something, why can't you get over it? You know, I, I know, I know, I know that there, there are women out there who've been betrayed, who've been hurt, who've been mistreated. The man's gotten a child on you on the outside and you have to bear that embarrassment and bear that burden and you've been frustrated with it and irritated with it. But somehow or another, you settled in your heart and I'm going to go ahead on and get over it. But sometimes your children can't get over it. Sometimes the children can't accept it. They, I can't really accept that that's my brother. I really can't accept that that's my sister. I can't accept that. And the reality is the child had nothing to do with being born. I'm talking to somebody today. The child had nothing to do with being here. The child had nothing to do with being born. The child didn't go and ask somebody, could I be born? Could this be my daddy? Could this be my mama? The child didn't ask to be here. And yet what, what ends up happening is we hold grudges and we don't understand that the grudges divide us. We hold grudges. We don't understand that the grudges can cause us to die from some type of heart disease. It can cause our arteries to harden. It can cause us to have indigestion problems. It can mess our entire life up because we refuse to let it go. See, here mother has gotten over it. And I can only imagine the battle that she had to go through in order to get through. How you know this, Pastor? Because I put somebody through the same thing. I got two sons who are the same age and they're not twins. And I can only imagine the pain that that individual had to experience because of my stupidity and because of my mistakes. But here's the thing. If the person can get over it, why can't you? It's so important for us to take a look back or take a step back and look at life from a different perspective. And we have to look at life from this perspective. What if God didn't forgive us for what we did wrong? Well, what, what if God held grudges against us for the things that we did wrong? Where would we be today? I've seen it where little children, I'm talking about before they hit 10, could get outside and get in, be playing with each other and get into it and go to fight like cats and dogs. And their parents find out about it and then here come the parents. The parents are at odds and fighting with each other. And in 15 minutes, them, them little kids, it's back outside playing again, hugging each other, forgiving each other, and back having fun with each other again. But guess what's happening? But the grown-ups don't forgive each other. They're still at odds. Did you not see that the kids forgave each other? Did you not see that the kids hugged each other? Did you not see that the kids still went back outside and started playing again? Did you not see that the kids played the video games again? Did you not see that the children just put it all behind them and went on with their life, but you as a grown-up is still holding on to grudges? They got over it, but you're still fighting behind it. And you've been fighting behind it for years. For years you've been fighting. I don't like her. I don't like him. And y'all at odds. But what you don't know is your children are passing each other in school every single day, high-fiving each other, playing on the basketball team together, playing football with each other today. You know what I'm saying? Enjoying one another. And you are still mad. If they could get over it, why can't you? I'm talking to somebody today because you've been carrying this hurt, this animosity, this unforgiveness in your heart for so long and it's causing calluses to build on your heart. And now you're in church, you're dancing, you're jumping, you're jerking, you're jiggling, you're shouting, you're speaking in tongues. You're doing all of that. You're giving your tithe, you're giving your offering. But yet you're still holding on to this and you haven't gotten over it yet. If, if, if your mama could get over it, why can't you as the child get over it? If, if, if your mama could forgive your daddy, why can't you forgive your daddy? If, 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 if the kids could forgive each other, why can't you as parents forgive one another? See, when I looked at that situation and saw the little kids, because I remember, you know what I'm saying, me, me and Tupelo used to get into it all the time. You know what I'm saying, Al Thomas, so we get into it all the time. Wrestling, get into it all the time, be right back out there playing playing flag football together with all my granddaddy rags, mechanical rags, and losing them. Either he'd be back knocking on my door, Chris, you coming outside to play? I'd be on his door ringing his bell, hey, Tula, you come outside to play today? This is what we did. You understand? But grown folks can't always push it away, can't always get rid of it. And I found out that this is a learned behavior. It is taught to us. We are gradually taught it. We are gradually taught to have unforgiveness in our heart. We are gradually taught to not forgive one another. It is taught to us. May I tell you today that you have to make the decision that you are going to let it go, not for their sake, but for your own personal sake. You are going to drop it. You are going to get rid of it because you need to live, you need to enjoy life. And there are many people today who are watching me, you are holding grudges. 
and you're holding grudges and you're holding them for too long. You're still mad at the husband because of the way he treated you and left you. And you're looking at your situation and I got kids and he left me with these kids. I gave my life to him and then he stamped all over my heart and you're still holding grudges. But you haven't taken a look at what God has done for you. What do you mean, what do you mean Pastor? Here, he, he left you in a bad situation. But God didn't let you be homeless. He, he left you in a bad situation. But God didn't let you go without food. He, he left you in a bad situation, and, but you and your children didn't go without anything. He showed up and he, she, he blessed your life. And if you stop and take a look at your life right now, you're going to find out that you are better off today than you were yesterday. The God that who, who tried to talk to you about not marrying the individual and you overrode and did what he, did what he told you not to do. You did it anyway and you're, re, you're, you're suffering the repercussions of a decision that you made. You overrode God. But guess what he didn't do? He didn't abandon you in the process. Because watch this now. He has a right to hold a grudge against us if he chose to, but he doesn't choose to. Because we chose to override what he said. We chose to, to, not, to not do what he told us to do. And here we are today. We're holding grudges. And we're not realizing that the grudges are destroying us. There are people today who don't even, there are sisters and brothers who won't even talk to each other today. Because you are mad because of something that your daddy did or something that your mama did. That child didn't ask to be born in the same way you didn't ask to be born. So now all of a sudden here you are. Your sisters, your brothers, and you want fellowship with each other. Well, that's my stepsister. She got, she got a different daddy than me. You know, she got a different mother than me. If you don't stop with the foolishness, if you don't stop with the foolishness, let me say it to you one more time. If you don't stop with the foolishness and understand that that is your blood, if you don't stop with the foolishness and understand that the child could not be born if God did not allow it to happen. So here's what you have to do. You have to put your differences to the side. You got to go to God and you got to ask God to help me with my grudges, help me with my attitude, help me with my mindset. I am angry, God, and I'm upset because of this and because of that. I hate that this happened. I hate that my daddy did this. I hate that my mama did this. But here is where I am now. And here's what you're doing. You're opening yourself up now for God to do surgery on you, to remove those things that are hurting you. I got nurses on here who are watching me today. You, you, you're putting yourself in a position where now God now can take the little mechanical instruments and go into the spiritual side of your arteries that are being hardened and clogged up because you holding grudges that you won't forgive. Can you imagine now that you don't have full capacity of your spiritual arteries because you refuse to forgive? It is like grudges. It, it's, it's, like, it's like your arteries are becoming hardened and backed up where the blood supply cannot flow at the level that it's supposed to flow because you are allowing it to be backed up. And last week when I taught it backed up, and we're trying to flush the toilet. Man, it seemed like everything that was in the line came back out of the toilet. And it's because the toilet was clogged up. The pressure was not there to flush the toilet. And so here we are. My wife is saying, honey, honey, this toilet is overflowing. So now I got to come in here and see what the deal is. And so now we got to get a plumber to come in here to do something about it, to get the line clear. See, that's what happens when you hold grudges and animosity toward other people when you won't let it go. You are backing up the, your own toilet line and somebody has to come through who's a professional with a snake and stick it inside and turn it and turn it until everything can be pushed and flushed out in order for the toilet to function properly. When you don't forgive, when you hold grudges against people, you allowing your life to be backed up. Everything that you thought you got rid of, you didn't. It's just in the line and it's going to come out if you don't let it go. I'm talking to somebody today because you have been the individual who've been holding grudges. He left me, he hurt me, but you didn't stop to look at your life Look at what God has done for you. He has made you better today than you were yesterday. You got a better job. You got, you got, you got your dignity back. You understand? You're not walking around with this embarrassment on you anymore. You're not walking around with this frustration on you anymore. Because watch now, everybody in the town know you were cheating, that you were being cheated on. Everybody know that you were being mistreated. Everybody knew it but you. You knew a little bit about it, but you didn't know the full detail. So every time you showed up and you was out with him, people are looking at you and 
snickering and laughing and you couldn't figure it out. Now all of a sudden you know you don't have to carry that embarrassment anymore. You've been free from this and God has given you an opportunity to just wake up in the morning and breathe without blockage. And I'm talking to somebody today. You got to make a decision that you're not going to hold grudges anymore. Here's a sign that many of you hold grudges. You wake up in the morning and you're so grouchy. You're grouchy for no reason. You're just grouchy. It's because you're holding grudges. You have to let this thing go. You are grouchy. You're always groaning, complaining, mumbling, and grumbling. It is because you're holding grudges. The person who does not hold grudges is not grouchy. The person who does not hold grudges don't mumble and complain. The person who does not hold grudges does not complain about everything. They wake up in the morning and they are glad to be alive. One of my favorite sayings is, any day above ground is a good day. I'm alive today. It's a good day. I may not have all the money in the world, but it's a good day. May not drive the best car, may not live in the best neighborhood, may not have the finest, fancy clothes to wear, but it's a good day today because I'm alive. I'm talking to somebody today. You got to let the grudges go. This is why you can't get a husband because you hold grudges. It is showing in you. When people come and want to talk to you, they can't because you are holding grudges. You think that it is because of your weight. You think that it's because maybe you don't, you're not as cute or as handsome as somebody else. But the reality is people see the grudges and the animosity that you are carrying. You are not outgoing like you used to be. You're not bubbly like you used to be. When people speak to you, you are sarcastic. You got an attitude and your attitude is nasty. And then when people take a step back away from you, you're one Wondering, why are they stepping back from me? It is because you grudge you. You got grudges on the inside of you. And for some of you, you have not forgotten the day and when you were offended. Watch now. The Bible tells us that offense will come. Scripture tells us there's no way you can live in this world and offenses not come. Offenses will always come as long as you live in this world. How you handle the offense will determine if you're ready to go to the next level. All right. I, I never forget. I told this testimony before, but I never forget, uh, you know, during the summertime, the house to be at, you know, Al Thomas Circle in the summertime, what was Miss Irene Powell in the house. That was the house to be at during the summertime. You understand? We're going to be down there. The, 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 the Isidore down there. Tony is down there. You know, Moses Hopper down there. Uh, you know, two little bo 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 boogie is down there. You understand? It, the house full of kids. You understand? We down there. That's the house to hang out and play at. And I remember, never forget, I'm coming down the street and I see them laying on the ground. I'm trying to figure out what they laying on the ground for. I'm a kid. I'm going to go run over and lay on the ground with them too. So I go over there and I see they got a box with a stick holding it up with a string attached to the stick and they got little breadcrumbs there. And I'm trying to figure out what they're doing. And what they were doing was in competition to see who could catch some of the house birds that was flying around. And so what they do, put the little breadcrumbs there and then as soon as the bird comes under there to get the bread, they would pull the, pull the string and the top would fall on the top of them. And so they were in competition. So I jumped down there. And I'm trying to get in competition too. But they won't let me play because it ain't my turn. They won't let me play. You got to wait. You got to wait. So I'm sitting there. And as I'm waiting, I'm observing. I'm trying to figure out, why in the heck do these birds keep flying out of here? Didn't they just see their homeboy get arrested? Didn't they just see their homeboy get caught up? Didn't they just see their homeboy get snared up? Why do they keep coming? I couldn't figure that out. And I didn't realize now that they were paying no attention to that. They were paying no attention to that. See, watch this now. Offense is nothing more than a snare. It's a trap. It's a setup to get you caught up so that you won't be able to go to the next level in your life. See, if you can't go to the next level in your life, then you cannot teach it to anybody else. That means if you can't progress, if you can't push forward, if you can't push through, then children who are connected to you, family members who are connected to you cannot go to their next level because you, as the example, did not make it. You didn't push through. You didn't persevere. You didn't make the decision that you're going to let it go. You didn't let it go. And because you didn't let it go, you were ensnared. And guess what you did? You got arrested and your kids were arrested too. There have been, there have been stories of women who, who, who got arrested and they were pregnant. And so guess what's happening? They're pregnant while they're in jail. And there are many of you right now, you are pregnant with destiny. And you're in jail today because you refuse to let it go. If she could get over it, why can't you? 
If he could get over it, why can't you? If they could get over it, why can't you? Here you are. You are pregnant with gifts that could change the world. Pregnant with gifts that could make your family wealthy for generations to come. But you can't get past the grudges and the animosity. So here you are locked up in prison with the baby of destiny on the inside of you. I came to talk to somebody this morning and tell you that it ain't worth it for you to hold on to it. It's not worth it. Why are you going to die carrying grudges? You're mad at him for something that y'all got into it when y'all was in the ninth grade and y'all 65 years old now. You're 12 and 13 years old, 14 years old back then. And you're still having issues and animosity and you're 65 years old. So for over 40 some years, 50 years, you are holding on to grudges and you have never progressed in life. Every time you take a step forward, somehow or another, you end up taking two to three steps backwards. It's almost like you can't get ahead in life for losing in life. And it's because you won't let go. You're still holding on to the grudges. You can never progress and never become what God has called you to be because you won't let go of the grudges. Every one of us can pinpoint the time that something happened to us that caused us to have an attitude. I'll never forget the day that I made a decision that I wasn't going to be a part of the ministry with my pastor, Apostle Wayne Wallace. He gone home to be with the Lord. I'll never forget he hurt me so bad that I didn't know how to process the hurt. You got to remember, I'm driving him everywhere he needed to go. I would come over to his house and get his clothes and take them and have them washed and have them cleaned. I'm paying for it out of my pocket. I'm, I'm being a true armor bearer. I would drive over to his house and get his car and wash his car myself. When he showed up for church, I was already outside of church waiting on him. Everything was already set, prepared, and ready for him. All he had to do was grab the microphone and approach the podium. I carried his bags. I did all this thing, everything. I was there every step of the way, and I'll never forget. My wife, I had gotten, a, I had gotten an invitation to come to Chicago to preach. My very first time ever being out of the city to preach anywhere. And here I am. I'm going to Chicago, my wife and I together. We get to Chicago and had an amazing experience, man, preaching and teaching the gospel. Saw some people get saved, saw some miracles happen, and here I am, I'm just so excited. And I called him on that Sunday when we were in the hotel room to tell him how everything went. He's listening to me, but I could tell he's not listening to me. And here's what he said to me. Next time you go out of town, you have to ask me for permission. And I said, uh, sir, I did ask you for permission. You're the one that told me to go, that this would be a good experience for you. Yeah, I know, but, but next time you have to wait. I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the heck is going on here. And he tells me that there's a lady in the church who did something that they were not supposed to do. And he's upset with her. He says, but I know, I know you don't have a conversation with her. Sir, I, I never had a conversation with her. So I brush it off. He upset about something. Okay, he's going to take it off me, but, but okay, I can handle it. I never forget, I get back and I'm driving down the 91 freeway. And as I'm driving down the 91 freeway, he calls me and he tells me that he's upset with me because I told this lady that she could start a ministry and do work. I said, sir, I never told this lady nothing. I ain't never had a conversation with this lady. He said, yes, you did. She told me you did. I said, sir, I never had any conversation with this woman. He said, well, she told me you'd have been to her house a couple of times, sir. I've never been to this lady's house. I've only been to her house one time, and that's when you brought me there, and you had a, a, a box of books, and you wanted me to take it to her house. I never had a conversation with this lady. I never went in her house before. And, and he's talking to me, and I said these words, sir, I need you to believe me. I didn't do that. And here's what he says to me. I neither believe you nor disbelieve you. I'm on the mountain doing a good work, and I can't come down. Immediately, that hurt me. I know where I was. I was on the 91 freeway, passing Wilmington on the 91 freeway, headed toward Long Beach. And that hurt me so bad that this is what he said to me, that I walk with you all this time and you can't believe that my character is intact. And I'm telling you, I don't, I didn't do this. And you, and I'm saying to you, I need you to believe me. You tell me you neither, you neither believe me nor disbelieve me. And so here's what I did at that moment. I made the decision. 
I'm done. I'm out of here. I ain't messing with this church no more. I'm, I'm up out of here. And at that point, I started working on a, a, a way of getting away from that ministry. I was still serving, but wasn't serving with my heart. I'm still serving, but I don't have the right attitude with it. I'm still serving, and I don't have the right spirit with it. So here the devil is compounding everything now. Here we are. I'm scheduled now to preach this Sunday morning in service. He's got about three or four churches that he's over. My wife is a witness. She can testify this. And he done had all those churches shut their service down and come be with him that Sunday morning. And here I am. I'm the speaker. Before I get up to preach, he gets the microphone. He's riling up the crowd and he tells the people, I want you to get up and go forgive anybody who's done you wrong. I'm, I'm you know, if some of you need to forgive, you're going to preach this gospel got an attitude with people. And he turns around and he's looking at me as he's talking. I'm sitting in the pulpit. I'm like, oh my God, my heart sunk. So here I am. This is a true story. Here I am. I get up and I'm walking and asking people to forgive me that I ain't never met before. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get my spirit right so that I can stand and minister to people. He gave me the microphone and now it's time for me to preach. I got to preach through this pressure that he just put on me. And I stand up and I preach and I preach like I lost my dog on mine that morning. People are standing and clapping. Folks are saying in the service, I got to get that CD. I got to get that CD. I got to get that CD. He gets the microphone again. And he lights into me in front of everybody. All three of these churches, he lights in front of me. The congregation is packed full of people. And he lights into me again. And when I tell you he lights into me again, it's like he took all breath out of me. And here I am. I can't believe that he did that to me. So now I'm really getting up out of here now. It was so bad on me and so bad on my wife that we sat outside in our car and couldn't drive off. That's how bad it was. That I'm sitting there, I, I, I was so hurt. We sat there in front of the church after the church was closed for 20 minutes. We didn't even talk to each other. My wife got tears streaming down her eyes. And I'm sitting here like to myself, why he do me like this? We leave to go to the restaurant to sit down and eat and couldn't even get out the car there. That's how bad it was on us. And so now here I am. We up out of here. We up out of here. So here I am. I got animosity. I got grudges. I got issues. I got anger in my heart to the point I'm about ready. I'm ready to fight you. You understand? I'm ready to fight him. I'm telling you straight up, I'm ready to fight. That's how angry I got. I'm ready to fight him. I am ready to go back to the church and meet with you and ready to throw hands with you. That's how angry I am. Because you got to know something about me. You can't push me over. I ain't going to let you push me over. You can't run me over. You None of that. I ain't going for it. I, man, I'm ready to do something to this dude. And I'm saying to myself, no, just leave. Just leave. I'm still working my plan to leave. He's having a revival that night, the next week, and, and I'm there. I'm at the church. I'm still serving. I don't got the right attitude, but I'm still serving. I know how to mask it and cover it up. So here I am. I got everything prepared. He drives up. I, I get his bags. He don't speak to me, but I get his bag, take it inside. He's got a guest speaker showing up, and I'm outside. I'm waiting for my wife to come because she's getting a park. I need her to have a parking space up front and not down the street. So I'm waiting on my wife to come and the guest speaker pulls up and he got his wife, his family and a couple of the people with him. I don't see him. I'm focused on waiting on my wife to come. I see my wife coming down the street and I'm like, okay. So I walked to a place where I got combed off for her to park. And he said, hey, you, you hear me talking to you? I'm like, who, who the hell he talking to? And, I, and he says, uh, you see me with these people, get yourself down here to help me. Now you gotta remember these two preachers are friends. I look down the street at him. I say, brother, you don't want this smoke. You, you don't want this smoke right here. You better watch your mouth. You don't want this smoke. And so he, he looks at me and I look at him. So now I know you two been talking. He gets up in church and he preaches against me in the service. And I'm sitting there. Now I'm angry. I'm, I'm going to whoop both of y'all tonight. You understand? I'm going to whoop both of y'all. But, but I'm pushing myself past it. I come back that Tuesday night, the next week for Tuesday night for Bible study. I know this testimony is long, but bear with me. I come back that Tuesday night for Bible study. When Bible study is over, that same preacher who was preaching against me 
cause my pastor on the phone. You know how when you're in close proximity to somebody on the cell phone, you can hear their conversation depending on how loud they got the cell phone. And he asked my pastor a question. Did your Gehazi come to church? Oh, Lord, I'm about to reach through the phone, slap him. I'm going to beat you up. I'm, I'm, my head, I ain't on, I ain't on, I'm on one. I'm about ready to go crazy. And I got myself, I had to catch myself. And I had to say to myself, this fight ain't worth it. But I did say to the pastor, I'm not a Gehazi. I never betrayed you. I never belittled you. I never mistreated you. I never did anything against you to steal anything from you. But from that night on, I was gone. I left. When I started a ministry, I started a ministry before my time, all because I was hurt and frustrated and angry and had an attitude. I let offense get into my heart and it caused me to go start a ministry that I was not prepared to start. I could preach, but I wasn't ready administratively. I didn't know how to do this and didn't know how to do that. But what I did was allow the devil to push me to a place that I should not have been in. And so here I am. I'm wandering in the wilderness for seven years until I meet <laughs> Apostle Fred Hodge. And now all of a sudden I'm pulled out of the wilderness because I bumped into the right person that could help me. Where would my life have been? Where would my ministry have been if I would have made the decision to stand against the persecution, I mean, stand against the persecution with the right attitude and the right spirit and not let the devil push me out into a place that I was not prepared for. And many of you are like that today. That grudges have set in. You have become increasingly dissatisfied about everything. And it has pushed you into a place that you're not prepared for. Some of you, it pushed you into the arms of a man that you didn't like and you were not prepared to handle. For some of you as a man, it pushed you out and you began drinking and smoking and doing all kinds of things and it messed your life up. It is because you said, I can't handle the pressure. And this is how you know you're at a point where you are unforgiving because you're saying, I can't take no more of this. That's a sign that you're at a place of unforgiveness in your heart and you got to detox today. You got to get rid of it. You see everybody taking all this tea and drinking all this tea to lose all of this weight. You're going to have to take this word and drink it like tea and get rid of this excess weight, this excess weight of unforgiveness and grudges that you've been holding on to down through the years. You got to get rid of it. If you don't get rid of it, your life will never be anything. And the people who are connected to you will never be able to prosper. If you don't get your heart right today, generations who are attached to you will never be able to get it right. You will pass down your generational actions because of the way you acted, because of the way you handled yourself, because of the way you dealt with the issue. So now all of a sudden you pass it down to your child and your child passes it down to their child and the next generation has it because it's in your DNA. If she can get over it, why can't you? Well, pass this too hard. It's only hard to the person who believes that it is hard. You gotta make the decision that you're going to get over it. And I'll never forget, a few years after that, I had been talking to God about my situation. I don't like the way they treated me. And God told me, you needed this in order for you to know what ministry is all about. You needed this so that you would know how to minister to people, so that you would know how to comfort people, so that you would know how to care for people. You needed this. And there's some of you today, you are going through this because you need it. You need it. You wouldn't have compassion on people today had you not gone through some of the things you went through. Had you not gone through some of the things that you went, you went through, you would not be the individual who you are today. Had it not been for God allowing you to deal with some issues, you would not be as strong as you are today. You are able to look back at certain things that your children are going through and saying to them, man, that thing ain't that big of a deal. You're going to be all right. I'll close with this, my son. So the Navy contacts me and he, when he calls me, I know it's a problem. That something ain't right, you know what I'm saying? His calls to me ain't no, hey, daddy, how you doing call. I'm just checking in. You need some advice about something. And so, what you want? So that's how I talk to myself. What you calling me for? I know something ain't right. What is it? What you want? Well, well, dad, uh, I just called. No, you ain't just called. Well, can I just call? No, you don't just call. What, what, what's the deal? What is it? You done got in some trouble out there. Something happened. What? You, you arrested? What is it? No, none of that. Okay, then what's her name? And he paused. I said, uh-huh, it's a girl. What is it? What is it? 
Well, Dad, I met this girl. We was in boot camp, and we was cool with each other. We thought we was going to have a relationship. And then all of a sudden, she got orders to go somewhere else. And then she said she didn't want to be in a relationship no more. And, and why she do that? And I started laughing. I started laughing. Well, Dad, it's not funny. I said, yes, it is funny. I said, look, boy, you're 18. You'll be all right. You'll find somebody else. There's plenty more fish in the sea. Trust me. You're going to find something else. This ain't all that bad. It ain't all that bad. Look, be happy that it's 18 when it happened. You understand? Make Thank God that you're not 35 when it took place. you 18. Boy, you're going to be all right. There's plenty of girls in the place. I said, you ain't got no tattoo with her name on you, do it? Oh, no. Okay, well, you still winning. You understand? You winning. You cooking with good grease right now. Don't lose your mind over something stupid like that. You're going to be all right. There's plenty more in, out here in the world. Y'all just was, you know, trying to hook up with each other because you was in... You was in boot camp together. You ain't got nobody else. Look, calm down. Go go dry your eyes. Blow your nose. You understand? Wash your hands. Take a bath. You're going to be all right. This ain't that big of a deal. You got much more life in front of you. You good to go. Dad, this is not a game. And no, it's not a game. <laughs> it's not a game. You know? But thank God that you experienced it early on in life. Now you can push through and make it through. It ain't that big of a deal. <laughs> and so he said... Well, you act like like it's not that bad. It, it's not that bad. It, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. You you not you not Mr. Telephone Man. You know Mr. Telephone Man. There's something wrong with my line. I can't get no cooperation. I try to call my girl. She wants to find. Hey, look, you, look. Bobby Brown them already hooked you up before you was ever even born. In the early eighties, we learned about Mr. Telephone Man. You all right? You all right? Just go listen to the song. You gonna be all right? You gonna be all right? You be all right? You gonna make it through? This ain't that big of a deal. Matter of fact, you may bump into somebody tomorrow. So quit playing. Don't lose your life. And so then we called, then he called back a couple of days later, and there he is smiling. <laughs> it ain't that big of a deal, bro. You cooler than a fan in the wintertime. You all right? You going to be all right? That people who watch me today, you have got to let the grudges go so that you can be what God has called you to be in life. You got to let it go. You got to remember generations depend on you. What you say and what you do, your actions will determine well, you're going to be at in life next. <laughs> That's my time right there. I pray you were blessed today. Remember, if she can get over it, why can't you? All right, listen, I'm getting ready to pray for people. I want to give somebody their day today. Don't go anywhere. I got to give somebody their day today. And uh, so, but let me pray for you all right, as first, first, okay? So don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. I want to pray for you. Then I want to give somebody their day, all right? Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift up every person who are watching, who's watching me today. I pray for peace and prosperity, for healing and deliverance. I pray for your grace and your mercy to cover their lives today. Father, for everyone who's holding grudges today, I ask that you would help us to get rid of it. Help us to push, push it past our lives, oh God, so that we might become all that you have called us to be. And God, I thank you for it now in the name of Jesus that you have, God. Open new doors for us and bless us tremendously. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I lift up my town, Itabina, Mississippi. I pray for my town's peace and prosperity, my town's healing and deliverance. I pray for your grace and mercy to cover my town now. And God, I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Now, Father, I lift up the Delta as a whole. And God, and I thank you that you are blessing and pouring your favor out all over the Delta now. And I give you praise and glory for it. Now, Father, we lift up the country of Belize. And I thank you, Lord, that you're blessing the works of the people's hands in the country of Belize. And I thank you, Lord, that favor is being released over their lives tonight. And I call every Belizean citizen blessed in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. All right. Got to give somebody their day today. Today is Mr. James Jackson's day. Whatever Mr. James Jackson wants, he gets whatever he needs, gets supplied. It's his day today. Show Mr. James Jackson some love today. Today is Miss Gloria Turner's day. Whatever Miss Gloria Turner wants, she gets whatever she needs, gets applied. It be her day today. So y'all show her some love uh, this morning. Also, I, I saw a new new picture up there. Uh, and, and I think it's Miss um, Deborah James. Miss Deborah James, it is your day today. Whatever you want, you get. Whatever you need, get supplied. It be your day today. So, hey, we showing y'all some love and some appreciation, all right? Do me a favor. Get your seed in the ground today. Go to our website at kingdomlifefaithcenter.org. Click on the online giving button there and get your seed in the ground today. Don't let this day go by without you getting the seed in the ground, all right? Remember, we are not the church or the pastor who's looking to get money from you. But, hey, if you've been blessed by the message, good thing to do is communicate uh, with the one who taught you. That's according to Galatians 6 and 6. 
that him that is taught the word communicate in all good things with the one who taught you the word. And that word communicate means to give to. So if you've been blessed by this ministry, hey, if your life is being transformed by this ministry, get your seed in the ground today, all right? I greatly appreciate y'all for doing so, all right? Get it in the ground. Hey, Miss Sandra Coleman is rocking with us today. So shout out to her today. Y'all show Miss Sandra Coleman some love uh, this morning as well. She's a faithful listener. So shout out to you this morning as well. I don't want you to think that I forgot you, girl. Good to see you. <laughs> Get your seed in the ground. Go to our website, kingdomlifefavesinner.org. Click on the online giving button there and get your seed in the ground uh, today. Don't let the devil rob you if you're giving. You can also give to me directly if you'd like through the Cash App. The Cash App is the dollar sign, Pastor C. Perryman. Again, Pastor C. Perryman. If you want to sow directly to my wife, it's the dollar sign, Pastor Sophia. All right. Hey, shout out to my spiritual daughter walking, watching with us today. Miss JL is on today. Love you, sweetheart. Miss Irene Holmes is in the house. Good to see you too. Thank you so much for being on. Miss Edna Powell, I believe I saw you earlier. So shout out to you today. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. So again, get your seat in the ground today. Remember, we don't believe in team I. Believe we believe in team we. We are team. So for every soul we win, for every life we change, for every person who gets built up, you get credit for it because you're a part of this team. All right. Love y'all. Gotta go, but we'll see y'all again. Uh, tomorrow morning. Keep the Perryman family in your prayers. We need them in this season, all right? So, hey, we love y'all so very much, and thank y'all so much. And oh, oh, also, shout out, big shout out to Miss Sheila Roby. Man, she's been on time for the last five broadcasts. She's been on time. Shout out to Miss Sheila Roby. We may have to consider giving you not just a gold star, but a certificate of attendance. You excellent girl. <laughs> we'll see y'all. Be blessed in Jesus' name. <laughs>